Colonel Brindell would want us to move on, and today we are very honored to have in our presence Colonel Mark Singleton, and he is going to be our speaker today. He's been married to his wife here, Sheila, for 37 years. They have three children, uh, and God has blessed them. This is a remarkable man. Uh, we had Mark here several years ago and spoke, and uh, he was not only, of course, a United States retired colonel, he's a Marine. He grew up here locally in Conway in that area somewhere. He'll talk a little bit about that. But after his service to our country, he came back. He has been part of the Homeland Security. He also teaches at the college up here at Ori Tech. And he's a Sunday school teacher at his home church in Conway. And it is with great, humble honor that I introduce our speaker for you today, Colonel Mark Singleton. Give him a welcome. Make sure your mic's turned on. Bring it. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Well, as, uh, as Danny says, can everybody hear me? I think I've got this thing turned on. As Danny says, I'm from Conway. I spent almost 30 years in the Marine Corps. And a lot of these Memorial Day presentations or speeches, people want to talk about what they've done and where they've been. And I want to do something different today. And I want to do something a lot different. When I sat down and I started writing this thing last night, I was like, what is really a message that you can give people today on Memorial Day? Almost every time I turn the television on and, and see something, it's like, break out the grill, let's go to the sale, let's go this. And what I'm going to encourage you to do on this Memorial Day is I'm going to encourage you to break out your Bible and turn to Daniel. Amen. And I'm going to tell you to break out your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 5 because that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about me because it ain't about me today. It's about what God has done for us and what God has done as a nation. And there's a lesson in that book of Daniel that I think we can all learn from. You know, Memorial Day is a time when we kind of take time and pause to remember those who've laid down their lives for this country. I think it was President Franklin Roosevelt who said that those who long enjoy such privileges that we enjoy forget in time that others have died to win them. Because what he's saying here is freedom is never free. It always costs something. And it's always the blood of patriots that have brought us to this point in our time. But the biggest battle I'm going to tell you today, that as Americans I believe we're fighting, is the battle for the very soul of this nation in which we live. Amen. We see it around us every day. I mean, the erosion of our society has been a slow and laborious process, but we've seen it accelerate rapidly in the last few years, and it really doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican, whether you're a Hillary Clinton supporter or a Trump supporter, it doesn't matter who's sitting in the Oval Office at all, because the nation that we've come to know and love continues to erode every day. The position, and I want to say this twice, and I made sure I highlighted it so I'd remember this, the position we're in today is because of what we tolerated yesterday. And the position we'll be in tomorrow will be because of what we tolerate today. I hate that word, tolerate. We don't have people with backbone anymore to stand up and say what's right and what's wrong. We tolerate it because we want to make people feel good about who they are and where they are. I'm tired of tolerating things. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm an odd man out over at Coastal, and I'm an odd man out over at Tech. I'm probably the most conservative professor they get. But I give them the truth, and I let them make their own mind up what direction, what path they're going to take. But you wouldn't believe the, the students that I get with the attitudes that they bring and the prejudices they bring into class and the one-way view of the nation and how this country is and where they got this, I have no idea. But I would argue or submit to you today that it starts in the home where we need to be teaching these children. That's why we got problems we got today. Well, if you take a look at this book in Daniel, history's got a way of repeating itself through the centuries. And in Daniel's day, he saw a lot of what we're seeing today. But the situation there was much worse. Because what had happened is in the fifth chapter, you see a collapse of culture. You see a, a, a city that has become comfortable with its walls and with its strength, but they crumble from within. 
because this was Babylon. And the way I see it, Babylon made four huge mistakes. And I'm going to talk about those mistakes today. And they're certainly applicable to you and every member in this congregation and everybody who hears this today. There are four of them. First of all, they lost their sense of remembrance. We have to remember what it took to bring us where we are today. The next thing, they lost their sense of reality and they lost their sense of restraint and they lost their sense of respect. On this Memorial Day, my prayer would be that we'd be challenged to be a people of repentance and that we'd acknowledge that anything we do is vanity without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about the first one, the danger of losing this sense of remembrance. You know, the last king was, after Nebuchadnezzar, was Belshazzar. And Belshazzar's problem was the same problem we have today. He'd forgotten some of the valuable lessons. If you remember, Nebuchadnezzar got, his, got too big of a head, got too prideful, and it led to his downfall. And Nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way. Those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Daniel 4, verse 37. In most cases, pride always comes before destruction. Daniel gives us an important insight when he challenges the king and the accusation that he levies saying, you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. That's what Belshazzar was doing, boasting about himself. Picked up right where King Nebuchadnezzar left off, saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power? and for the honor of my majesty. How many people do we know out there that have said, man, everything I got, I bid on my own. I'm a self-made man. I did this all right by myself. We well, you know that's the greatest lie any person can tell because unless you had the talents and skills bestowed upon you by God, you couldn't get where you got. Amen. Amen. And people are, are, are so self-centered that they forget that. They forget that these are talents that God gave you. Pride always comes before a fall. And it's right up there at the top list of things that God despises most. And if you don't believe me, you want to think I'm full of malarkey here today, then I'd say, ask, ask the devil. Because one time the devil let pride get him, and we know what happened to him. Amen. Or ask Adam and Eve. Or ask King David. Or ask Simon Peter. And yes, those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Mm. You know... This country used to honor America unashamedly and openly. Because if you go to any monument, it's in the numerous monuments all over the Capitol, it's carved and granted on government buildings. Everything we hold dear as related to Christianity is in many of these monuments and buildings. And it's printed on our currency. There was a time when we credited God with our blessings and our successes and turn to him in our trials and losses. But today, in this country, like Babylon, we seem to have lost that sense of remembrance. President Woodrow Wilson said it best, a nation that does not remember what it was yesterday does not know what it is today or what it is trying to do. We are about a futile thing if we do not know where we came from or what we've been about. In many ways, we've forgotten our past. We've forgotten the sacrifices of many. The controversy about whether you stand for the flag or whether you don't stand for the flag has been twisted and converted and turned, and, and no one can argue that this nation was built on the backs of men and women who fought and died for this country, and how could you not stand for that flag when it's presented? It's a crime if you don't do it, in my mind. And I realize I'm just one man, but I tell my students all the time, if I'm standing next to you and you don't stand, I'm going to be jerking up by the nap of the neck. Because I know people who died for it. Well, somebody said they try to twist it and they try to make it a racial thing. Well, uh, the, that flag, flag is the flag of prejudice. Well, here's what I'd like to do. For anybody that really believes that, if you really believe that, I'd like you to go with me to Fort Bragg one weekend when that big C-17 coming in from Afghanistan brings some of those bodies in, or meet me at Dover Air Force Base when they bring them in. And if you've got an issue with that flag, you go point out which coffins hold African Americans or which coffins hold blacks and which ones you want the flags pulled off or which ones you put on. Because regardless of color, men and women of all races have fought 
to secure the blessings of this nation and fought for this country, and they deserve the respect. When that flag goes up, you need to stand for it. So, so having, having said that, what makes America so great? Why did people come to America anyway? I mean, people went to Canada in search of trade routes and in search of gold. Uh, people went to Mexico and South. Cortez and the explorers years ago went in search of gold. But when people came to this country, they were in search of God. Because if you've studied European history at all, you know that the pilgrims and the, the settlers that came from England were escaping that persecution in the British Anglican Church. That's why we have something that says in our law today that we can't tell you, the government can't mandate to you where you go to church. Worship is free. But back during that time, if you were in England, you went to the Anglican Church. You worship how they told you, how the government told you to worship. It's not the case, and that's why people came here. Men and women came here looking for God, and they came looking for a home where God could be exalted the way he is supposed to be exalted, and worship in spirit, in freedom, and truth. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you, we've fallen a long way away from that today. We've gotten so far off the founder's path that it's not uncommon to see the federal courts repeatedly doing such things as restricting manger scenes from city squares. Can't even have a Christmas pageant anymore. Got to call it a holiday play. Okay? This, the Ten Commandments are, are basically removed from government buildings because they, they say that is a church versus state thing, which is not truth at all. Unfortunately, there are many sobering similarities between ancient Babylon and modern-day America. And just like Babylon, there's an expensive price to pay when a nation loses all sense of remembrance as to who they are and where they came from. The second thing I want to talk to you about is the danger of losing this sense of reality. In order to understand how the king had lost all this sense of reality, we need to remember that the outside of these city walls were the Medes, which are these ancient Iranian people, and the Persians that had surrounded the city. Thousands and thousands of enemies had surrounded the city of Babylon. And the Babylonians thought they were safe. They were inside having parties. They were drinking, they were having feasts, they were carrying on because they thought, because of this history of dominance that they had, because of the strong walls and the high walls that they built, that they were invincible and indestructible. These walls stretched for 60 miles in circumference, but everywhere you looked beyond the walls, you could see an enemy that surrounded the city. But hey, that's no problem. We got these walls, they're big, they're thick, they're high. Nobody's going to be able to, to, to break through these walls. And we've got a 20-year supply of stored-up food, just in case. So what did King Belshazzar do? He lost all sense of reality. He threw a big party, and he invited thousands of people where destruction was at his door. And the problem here, and here's a lesson that we need to learn today, when we begin to feel so secure in our own strength that this danger is just on the other side of the wall. Many people today think that just because they got away with something once, they can get away with it again. And the king, too, was blind and drunk on his own success to realize that the strength of a kingdom or of an individual is never on the outside, but it's on the inside. Babylon soon fell because they had become corrupt on the inside and with no more sense of remembrance or reality. Some people today foolishly think that God needs America to carry out his plan. After all, we won all the big wars, Cold War's over, although many would argue that we're probably getting ready to start another one. And we seem to only be the real superpower still left that can stand fast in the world today. But I believe on this Memorial Day, or this Memorial Day Eve, that God is telling us, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he also fall. We better remember who runs the show, folks. No matter what you think, no matter how tough you think you are or how bad you are or what organization you belong to, it ain't nothing unless God supports it.
transform the roof on your home, church, or business into this. A five rib metal panel roof from Dry Home Roofing, a Christian owned roofing company specializing in metal roofing and gutters. We install 29 and 26 gauge metal roofing with a 40 year warranty and a two year labor warranty. Our patented end cap helps to prevent wind damage and control water flow off the end of the roof. For your free estimate, contact Dry Home Roofing to transform your roof today. There are many here that think this nation as a whole is invincible, that we're indestructible, and nothing could be farther from the truth. But if you think about it, if you remember, there was a time when Israel was the world's only superpower. They were one nation under God. We say that, but we really need to start living that. And their motto was, in God we trust. 3,000 years later, God gave birth to another nation. God gave America a law built and based on Israel's ancient commandments. Why should we think we're invincible? I think that now more than ever, it's time for us to remember who we are and where we've come from. I think it's time for us to look at the reality of what's going around us and truly pray, God forgive us and God bless America for all the things we've done. The third thing I'm going to talk to you about is the danger of losing this all sense of restraint. Just completely letting go. When a nation or an individual loses all sense of remembrance and reality, they also lose this sense of restraint. The Babylonians were too blind to see any connection between the moral decay and national decline. Does that sound familiar? Morality is decaying in the country. And our strength is declining as well. This verse describes what the Old Testament politely called concubines. These were women who were kept for the king's pleasure for the purpose of sexual gratification and other procreation. Our nation, like Babylon, has been virtually given over to sexual permissiveness, perversions of all types. And I ain't got enough time to go through it here, and I'm not going to do it. But the bottom line is, whether you turn on the television, whether you go to the movie, whether you turn on the internet, whether you listen to the radio, it has basically stopped the spirit moving within families. Men have stopped leading their families in spiritual and moral development of young people. They've neglected their wives and children in pursuit of material wealth and power, and they've become so busy with their jobs that they ignore their wives and become involved with women outside the home, outside the marriage. As a result, what happens is the wives begin to seek their own worth, and they go outside the home, and the ones who really suffer is the children because your male and female role models now are no longer prominent in the home, and children are developing identity problems of their own. And we don't need to go into that, but we hear that every day. Many of them are neglected and, for the most part, undisciplined. That's what I see in the college. I mean, back when I was in college, if a professor said, hey, sit down and start reading, that's what you did. You didn't say, hey, I don't have to do that. I had one tell me, I don't care what grade you give me. I'm just here because my old man's paying for my truck. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I really want to look at him and say, come here, let me give you a throat a hug real quick. <laughs> That's what they need. And everybody says, oh, no, you can't do that. Oh, you need to treat them gentle. That ruins their, their self-respect. No, it doesn't. Discipline is what these kids need today. Yeah. And, it, and if you don't believe it... It, if you don't believe it, look at what we see in our court system and look at what we see on television with crimes that are being committed and these heinous crimes that are being committed. These school shootings, let me tell you right now, and this is just a personal opinion. If you took care of business at home, you wouldn't have this thing happening in a school. What, what, what I have seen over time is that people will have children and drop them off at school as if that's another provider or, or daycare provider. Okay, I've had a kid, but I don't have time for you, so you go to school and they'll take care of you. And that's where we run into problems. And you see it every day. And that's something that's got to change. The last thing is, I would tell you, is the danger of losing all sense of respect. And to me, this is the most important. Because in this story of Daniel, we see Babylon crumbling. Nothing was sacred to them anymore. They'd abandoned all absolutes. There were no more restraints, and there were no more respect for anything that was sacred. 
Basically, it was party time in Babylon. We got these big walls. These people can't get in. And then an amazing thing happens. The fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lamp stand on the plaster of the wall. This is Daniel 5, verse 5. The king sobered up, his knees knocked against each other. Into the party hall comes Daniel. And now he wasn't at the party, but most people don't want the man. When you're having a party, they don't want a man of God around when there's a party going on. When the liquor's flowing and the women are dancing, last thing you want to see is the preacher, okay? You want him to be on the road. But when this writing takes place on the wall, when this crisis comes, they no longer want their immoral friends and drinking buddies. They're looking for someone who can tell them what it means. And as Daniel looked around, the shouting and the drinking and the sex came to a stop. And a strange silence kind of came over that banquet hall. And people looked as if they were frozen in time. These sacred vessels were scattered all about the tables. And Daniel was the only one in the room who was calm. Then he did what every preacher should do. He took God's word without fear or favor and simply revealed to them what God said. And listen to Daniel as he stands before them. Before he interpreted the handwriting on the wall, he preached a sermon to them with three points. First, there was a word about power. Daniel reminded Belshazzar the king that King Nebuchadnezzar's power came from God. Second, there was a word about pride. Pride goeth before fall. Daniel reminded King Nebuchadnezzar, or reminded the king that Nebuchadnezzar lost his kingdom because of pride. And third, there was a word about punishment. King Nebuchadnezzar was punished until he came to realize that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomever he chooses. And then Daniel applied the text, you have not humbled yourself, although you knew all this. He said, King Belshazzar, you knew about the power, the pride, and the punishment, but sadly you've lost all sense of remembrance, reality, restraint, and respect. And when we forget these things, we become blind to the fact that like Babylon, our problems aren't primarily political or economic or social. The decline of any nation stems from spiritual factors. Everything else is just symptomatic. Now back at this banquet hall, I told you the hall is quiet now. Daniel now reveals the handwriting on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel, absarin. These words reveal three elements involved in the sinner's destruction, numbered, weighed, and separated. In other words, what those words were telling people in that banquet hall is your days are numbered, judgment is coming, and you're going to be separated from God for eternity. Now that ballroom turns from party central to like a scene of fright and terror. But there was one person who stood still and stood peacefully because Daniel wasn't scared. He wasn't concerned about his destiny because... He knew the one who had written on the wall. The fifth chapter of Daniel concludes with these words. That very night, Belshazzar was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom. That very night. And also that very night, while Babylon had parted with no sense of restraint or remembrance, the armies of the Medes and the Persians were able to divert the Euphrates River into a swampland and they marched right into the city underneath those walls through the dry riverbed and took the city. And what you need to take from this this morning, folks, is God's judgment is certain. Folks, there's not a wall high enough or thick enough to prevent a person or nation from falling when God writes, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Absara. Who knows how close we might be to our number being called today when we walk out of this church. Who knows how close we might be to facing God's judgment today? One thing we can know for sure is what side we'll be on as he separates the sheep from the goats. Very few nations, I will tell you, have had a history like America. For well over 200 years, we've been the shining light in the world around us, and we've been the launch pad to take God's gospel literally to the ends of the earth. We often hear people say that God is our only hope. But I would argue today that unless we change, God could be our biggest threat. What is it about America that offers us the exemption that neither Babylon or Israel were given? There's a last night for every nation and for every individual. In light of eternity, what is the kingdom of Babylon or any other nation compared to the kingdom that is forfeited by men and women without Christ? Our days are indeed numbered. And we have to have, and all of us have to have this sense of urgency in exchanging our own righteousness for the righteousness of Christ through the new birth 
that is only offered through salvation. So on this Memorial Day, I'd like to close and say that as we remember those who gave so much for the freedoms we enjoy today, may we be reminded that in the words of Daniel, the Most High still rules over the affairs of men. And may we humble ourselves before him, and then may God truly bless America. I got me about 20 sermons out of that. <laughs> well, thank you. As we close today, we do want to remind you we do have a dinner out back. You're more than welcome to stay. We've got plenty of food. Men have been here all night uh, cooking. And we want to thank all the people, the ladies, men, who decorated the young people who put the flags out. Somebody asked me one time, Colonel, why do I do this? Well, you know, as a senior minister, I can stop anything I want. And that's just the truth. But I would not dishonor the human beings that have given the freedom to me to preach. You see, Christ gave us the freedom of our souls, but it was a soldier that gave us the freedom that we could stand and preach the gospel to anyone who in this world needs it. Amen? Amen. So that's why we do it. Also to educate the young people. Listen. in a way, an odd thing to honor those who died in defense of our country, in defense of us, in wars far away. The imagination plays a trick. We see these soldiers in our mind as old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, grave and gray-haired. But most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were living, and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. We owe them a debt we can never repay. All we can do is remember them, what they did, and why they had to be brave for us.